So it looks like it's streaming live. I'm hoping that it's streaming live. Um, <laughs> again, <laughs> this is Voices of Color. Um, it looks like we're, we may be having some technical difficulties, but hopefully this comes through. Um, as such, I'm going to record just in case. Nope, it's going. Excellent. Okay. So welcome back. Sorry for the start and stop glitches. If you know any you've watched this show before, oh, again. I, all the time. <laughs> I think it stopped. Did it stop? Is yeah. it going? Yeah. Mm. At least the screen is. So is it. Let me see. Okay, we are streaming live. Excellent. Um, <laughs> this happens a lot. I get, I am technically, technically, technologically challenged. Uh, I think folks who have watched that for a bit know that it doesn't matter how early I prep, I always have some, some difficulties. But just to reiterate, this show is not endorsed by Society for Creative Anachronism. This is a place for people to be our authentic selves, uh, for people of color to come and share their stories, validating each other sharing um, experiences so folks are able to see the people behind the, uh, you know, the persona, see the people behind the garb. Um, and we don't stop being people of color at the gate, after the gate. So we have this opportunity to share how our real life experiences overlap and intersect with the SCA experiences. Perfect. I just got a comment. It's coming through. Great. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. So now with a little bit of rocky start, uh, my name is Jean-Viev Shu in the SCA. Tonight, I'm Nina. Um, this is our second season of uh, Voices of Color and just started lining up some more. We have some great guests coming up. But tonight, I'm really excited. We have, I'm going to try this and I apologize ahead of time, Dame Goran Go Dukch Mamigonian. Close. 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 Okay. Close. Please, yeah. please correct me. It's Grandot. Grandot. Yeah. Um, because you've been in the SCA for a very long time and have so many wonderful stories. Uh, for those who are new tonight, I meet with our guests ahead of time, and our guests are all volunteers. So everyone who comes on is coming on willingly to help share information and teach those who want to learn. Um, but we had an opportunity to talk yesterday and our half hour turned into an hour because you just have this rich knowledge and experiences that I really hope we can get to tonight because some of the things that you were telling me are, are just amazing. And, and really to start <laughs> your origin story. So I don't know if you want to introduce yourself, or tell a little bit about yourself, but your origin story is one of those I thought pretty pretty cool things. Oh, well, um, I was. It just occurred to me that uh, I'll start the way Armenian storytellers start, which is okay. once there was, once there was not. Um, back in 1984, my family and I went to a um, heritage festival in Auburn, Washington. And there were different groups from different communities there represented. And the SEA was doing like a demo at a field, side field. And so I told my, my family, I'll, I'm gonna check this out and I'll meet you later. You know? And I ended up spending the whole time there because it just felt like I have arrived. you know. So I spent the whole time talking to the poor Chatelaine and looking at the different booths with art stuff. and. And I, I did get on the list to get the newsletter, but I got the Madrona list, which is nice, but I lived in Olympia. Um, so I just forgot about the SCA because I thought it only existed in the Seattle area. And so I wasn't willing to drive all the way through all that traffic just for something like fight practice or arts night or whatever. So, so this was uh, towards like around late summer, maybe early autumn in 84. And then in 85, around May, my local newspaper in Olympia did an article about the SCA doing this event called Mayfair. And there was a picture of um, Squire Fergus Fitzallen at the time. He is Sir Richard Fitzallen now. 
his wife and his child, they were all in garb. And it just absolutely delighted me because I thought, oh, okay, so it's not only in the Seattle, I can play here. So I definitely checked them out and by, um, and I didn't really get involved. I kept going to the business meetings just to actually to, to see, in the surface to see what events might maybe inspire me to get involved, but it was more to suss people out, to check the people themselves out, because being someone from the Middle East and experiencing different things here in America, about being someone from the Middle East, I wanted to check and see if these guys were safe, and also if they organized, you know, check out the organization itself. So by the time I did anything, it was really later in October that year, the, again, it's a community-wide thing in Lacey, in the mall there, different groups would show up and do like a demo thing. And sure enough, you know, I got into a, a dress I brought from Lebanon and gave out flyers about the SEA. But my real event really was 1986 Mayfair the next year. Um, I was in garb and, and haven't stopped except maybe briefly during when I was going to college. And 86 was big. I went to the World's Fair in Canada because they did, a, the SEA did a demo and it was during the birthday weekend, my birthday weekend. So I saw it as an omen. And so even though I was brand new in the SEA, I said, I have to do this. Yeah. And so, you just never left. Yeah, I never did. Here I am still. There've been some bumpy rides over the years, but still here. What was it like for you entering in. So we've talked about, you know, being able to look around, see safety, and, and part of feeling safe is seeing people that look like you, that have similar culture. What was it like when you started compared to now? Uh, when I started, um, uh, there was some, it wasn't like an actual written down rule, but it was all kind of understood that the SCA was Europe, medieval Europe or Renaissance Europe, something like that. So that on here, the kingdom that I started in, now I'm in Kaid, but in Antir, we were sort of pretending Antir is a kingdom like maybe like medieval France or medieval England or something. So I had to, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I, was, I was given to understand that I had to develop some sort of a persona story uh, you know, nothing in length, but just something to explain to people how someone like me, an Armenian from the Middle East, would be in medieval France or something. And I, I, that all, already almost made me, it turned me off already. And it made me kind of realize, you know, there aren't that many people of color in this society thing. And, I, and also not many people like me, like from the Middle East. So, and I wondered about that. So, um, so I so the, my first few garb was European, even though I chose well my ancestors chose for me that I would be an Armenian. There's there was no other choice for me and the culture persona that I was gonna be than an Armenian. But I still kind of wore um, European clothes. My first three garbs were European, but I would add some Armenian you know touches to the you know the trim or something you know. But mm -hmm. uh, as I got better, I, with the research, I got much closer to what my persona would be. And then I changed it midway because uh, I was originally 13th century Cilician, which is a minor kingdom, medieval kingdom of Armenian uh, culture people. And uh, in that time they wore Byzantine clothes and they took on French titles and coats of arms. and. And my purpose of being in the SCA wasn't just to learn about my culture because I never went to an Armenian school. My sister did, but I, did, I never did. I came to America um, from Lebanon uh, when I was about 12 years old, which is why I have an American accent. I used to have a different accent, by the way. <laughs> the English I spoke was a British English. So it was totally, this made me an easy target. So, um, so yeah, so the whole point wasn't just to learn about my stuff, but it's also to have others learn about it as well. And um, so I, I saw no point in maintaining this thing. If I don't look like an Armenian, you know, I, I don't give that opportunity to people to find out about the Armenians. So I totally went earlier period. So I changed the garbs 
changed my coat of arms, changed my name. And uh, I think, uh, it, yeah, finally, you know, Kyria, has, I'm not Kyria, um, but it's changed. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. official now that we're not U Eurocentric anymore, but it took, it was only recently. I mean, I was in yeah. 84 is when I was exposed to the SCA. I don't know, it was only within what, what, one year, two years ago. I don't know, it was very recent. Yeah. Very recent that they even changed that. So it's you know it's about time, but it, it's a hard. It was it's past you know, due, especially because you know you uh, people have these uh, because my other mission other than the Armenian thingy, but it was also to educate people about Middle East to break down the the stereotypes people have about Middle Eastern culture, which is still a bloody struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a uh, hard to break that down. But it's it's still something I have to do. So uh, it's nice that it's it's sort of changing now. You know, it's kind of in mm -hmm. the yeah. we're giving more opportunity for uh, these marginalized cultures to be represented and stuff. We're being allowed to do that now. Yeah. You know? But again, look how long it took to to get here. Well, I commend you for coming in and doing your really authentic self even before that, because I know that that must not have been easy to navigate, uh, you know, the society that says, uh, you know, Western European, and you're saying, no, this is, this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. This is, this is me and my authentic self. Uh, what kind of barriers did you have to overcome? Well, you know, the my first that first barrier was having to come up with something. So what I came up with was I'm a merchant's daughter and I'm in on tier in this Europe mm -hmm. place to see what things you guys need from the Middle East and what we might get from you. So I, that was my like first starting point of trying to adapt to what was given to me, you know, so that I could maintain being an Armenian and maintaining the whole purpose of being here. Uh, Did for me. ever ask like is that mm -hmm. a thing where people ask you about that or was that a well you, you felt the need I, I i felt the need but it seems to be i think i must have blocked off the memory for it because i seem to i, I mean it seems to be something that I, it's some a conversation i actually had with somebody you know wow yeah because it's a very strong feeling i have that it was actually a conversation but it was also an overall feeling i had that you know if you want to be part of this club this is where what we're representing we are representing we're representing the middle ages that was the mm -hmm. starting point even in that time now we'll go of course earlier and and also we went to the renaissance and of course we've gone later now so um so it's it's uh it's it's it would it would come the the I don't want to say a hardship, but yeah, yeah. Um, the difficulty mm -hmm. in maintaining this culture of mind within the SCA is that people, um, we're not actually in the past. We are not medieval people. We are modern people trying to represent the medieval past. So the modern world is constantly intruding here. So. Mm -hmm the political beliefs of people or the perceptions of people that people have about certain cultures stays with them. So whenever the Middle East is uh, in the news because of hostage taking or, or uh, wars that America is involved in, I become the face of the enemy. Suddenly I am spotlighted. And so those feelings sometimes get, um, they bleed into the SCA. Um, uh, it's and yet yeah, there and there as we have discussed <laughs> there have been times when I almost did quit because yeah it was you know most of us no matter what our backgrounds are we use the SCA as an escape from the modern world or from our jobs or from our families or whatever is going on and we try to form our own kind of escape vacation world. <laughs> <Maybe. Yeah. laughs> yeah. And 
so this is the place that it's supposed to be safe. And when it no longer becomes safe to be, as you said, authentic self, or even just mm -hmm. to be just a regular person living a regular life here in this country. Um, it's like, if I can't, you know, I can understand in the beginning when I joined the SCA that out there it's not safe sometimes, yeah. you know, but that it would be here because I assumed that uh, for people to be in this organization, they would have had to do some research to get into the costuming and the food or whatever. And so they are a little bit more enlightened or more educated. And that is true in some parts, but also it is not true because it is also, I've heard a friend call the SAA a costume cocktail party, you know, which is fine also, you know. But what it also brings in is when you have people like that who don't um, care enough to even do a minor research, you know, right. some of this stuff, they, they sort of respond to you the way they would respond in the modern world. And it, it's, it's like, okay, I, that's, not, that's not okay for me. Yeah. You know? So when, when it got really bad, I said, okay, I'm out of here. I need to be out of here. And of course, I'm talking about, as we mentioned before, it's 9-11. I mean, it actually bled into the SCA itself. I went to an SCA thing and, and we decided to hold it anyway. It was a drum circle workshop thing. And we were, the premise was we won't cancel it because it happened the same day. And we decided to go ahead and hold this if even if we don't do any drumming, we will be there for each other. And I mean, the minute the door opened, there is on the big screen the scene of the airplanes going into the building. And then it became worse. The atmosphere got worse and very accusatory until somebody finally said, hey, leave her alone. And and I just some I found myself somehow getting out of there. I don't know how I got out of there, but I've never gone back to that place. But I also said I need to quit this thing, you know, because good God, this is 9-11 is very traumatic for people like yeah. even more so for people who are Muslims. And that's, it's like, well, my, my anger actually isn't that I was mistaken for a Muslim. My anger is that it wasn't okay to be a Muslim, you know, yeah. as this country. So, so it's, it's already bad, but to have it happen within an SCA context, it was like, well, what's the point of being here? But, right. um, you know, a group of friends, including, you know, not just Greg, come on with me uh Dagmer and others sort of talk me talk to me and let me know that I'm safe with them they have my back so I'm here because of people like that but I hear that time and time again that you know people of color find our communities we find our safety and we have to you know for mental health for well-being for all purposes um and that's what keeps us coming back when yeah, it's the friends, you know, the friends yeah. and, the, and the connections you make, and, and it's still fun to do research and to try out whether it's costuming or the food or whatever it is you're into. It's it's still, you know, as long as there's still joy in doing that, it's like once that stops and if that kind of atmosphere still maintains, stays, and then the joy of doing the art and stuff also stops. <laughs> I, I am out of here, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think uh, one of my, and I've said on the show before, one of the phrases that really can activate me when I hear it is, you know, leave your politics at the door. Well, we would like to, you yeah. know, I would like to go glamping because now we have an RV because my back just can't do it. So I want to go glamping and put on costumes and, and put on pretty things and eat good food. And, you know, we we have identities that come with us that we can't just take off like garb and it, it it follows us. And I think it's, it's a very unfair expectation of others to say, well, leave your politics at the door when what they're saying is leave your identity at the door. Right. And yeah, for yeah. some people that's, that's fine. You can do that. I don't have that. People of color don't have that. Queer people don't have that. Like there is that option does not exist. Yeah. And it's hard to, to hear that. And at the same time, like you said, we all just want to have fun too. Like yeah. I don't didn't join this to, to come meet some racists. I mean, 
Halloween's my favorite holiday. This is as close as I get, 365 to it. Um, so we've, you know, given that you've been in for so long and you've you've experienced um, you know, these barriers and these in that case, bias incidents, hate incidents really targeted at you. What have you done to stay motivated besides community? Because I know community is a big thing. Yeah. But what are some of the things you do to stay in this? The the art base. It's like I'm constantly learning. I just learned uh, there's a um, Armenian um, embroidery uh, it, stitches. Uh, it's called oh. marash marash work because it comes from the Armenian town marash. And um, I, I've you know I've done you know I learned embroidery really formally when I joined the SCA. I learned a lot of things once I joined the SCA, and. <laughs> And so I've done all this embroidery stuff. I'm not like a really great embroiderer or anything, but but I thought all these years I felt really bad about being an Armenian and not knowing and be, knowing how to embroider, but not knowing how to do this embroidery. So so I had recently I had done a little bit of it um, once I started to do uh, the ANS display circuits up, up and on tier, you know, just to try it out. And I did just like, well, actually I have a piece that I have the original piece with me actually. Oh, very uh, cool. I dyed, I dyed the fabric, it's a little sample piece. So I dyed the fabric, but I used like yellow thread to do this the inner lace, let me see. Oh yeah, here it is. Hey, there you go. Oh, I love that. That is gorgeous. Yeah. So this thing takes gorgeous. like four different steps, four different rows or whatever wow. to do this interlace stuff. And so I did that once and then I went on to do other arts and stuff, but I still felt, oh my God, it's just so complicated. How the hell, how do you know <laughs> which, which goes up and which goes under and go up? So it's only recently that I said, I am doing this, damn it. You know, I, I, this, I just, so I've gone gangbusters. I've done, oh, <laughs> so I've been, this is like the Bijou, it's called the Bijou Tapestry. I've been taking it around. It's a group project for uh, Bijou Tremble, who is Mistress Flavia. She's the one, she and her husband uh, is the one who did the letter campaigning to save Star Trek. So uh -huh. um, a lot of people love them. And this is a project. This is sort of like a bio tapestry. Oh, that's phenomenal. And this is me, my contribution. And this is, I don't know if you could see it, but here's the yes. Marash embroidery. This is an, Ar I just recently had this. It's an Armenian carpet. Oh, very and cool. Bijou, let me see. This is Bijou. There's Bijou. This is her. And I did a little bit the Armenian stitchery here. And I did the bio tapestry here because I noticed nobody else did the actual bio tapestry stitch. So. That is cool. That is very cool. So once I learned it, hey, you know, gangbusters with it. So that's the, so it's the continuous challenge, continue, mm -hmm. continuously challenging myself to learn different things uh, about my culture and being mm -hmm. able to exercise it here mm -hmm. within the confines of the SCA is what motivates me and keeps me because this is my school, my Armenian yeah. school, you know, again, I said, I, I didn't go to an Armenian school. So this SCA is my school. So when well, you got your laurel, you, you kind of said for research, but really your focus was research into the Armenian culture, correct? Yeah, I was like, the, um, I, uh, I was definitely the only Armenian doing Armenian stuff in Ontario. And, um, but there, there are the, there's like a handful, at the time when I joined, there were maybe a handful of Armenians ethnically as well as persona wise mm -hmm. but um now there's a little bit more but i think i don't know i haven't done the research on this i don't know how i would but i think i am the only armenian laurel for armenian studies that you know? is very cool but we have uh since i i'm here i could mention uh, we have a facebook group called sca armenian persona um and it's ethnic Armenians as well as pers Armenian persona people. So there's a little bit more than a handful. That's mm -hmm. very cool. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads into 
one of the topics that we talked about briefly and has been, um, you know, really a theme as we're, as people are starting to discover their cultures and bring in more of their ethnicity and identity into the SCA and their personas about cultural appropriation. So for someone who comes into the SCA and says, I love Armenian culture, I want to have a persona that is based in Armenian culture, what is some advice that you might give or how would you recommend someone go through that journey if if they do at all? I would say, you know, my, my the first thing that comes in my head for in, even in general, not necessarily just Armenian, but I say, listen, listen to the people from that culture. Um, so it's uh, obviously uh, to avoid appropriation, the key is research. I, I wanted to actually mention one of the pictures you put there's a picture from my laurel ceremony, mm -hmm. but also the other was me wearing the Moroccan stuff, the bear bear stuff. And mm -hmm. I did research on that. I happen to have the fabula stuff and I, I did the full hike, hike thing. I didn't cheat. I actually did the whole rappy thing mm -hmm. uh, thing. And it was because of a friend of mine uh, was being knighted and I was one of the speakers and he was Moroccan persona. And he actually, he's from Kaid, but for a time was in my barony. And so there's a, I, I had just a slight little story here. Um, I came to Kayid in 2013 because my dad died. Um, and um, and I hadn't, I didn't sing for three years. Um, singing is one of my major things, you know. And the first event that I went to in Kayid that had any kind of singing that I participated in was Festival Rose, which is one of my favorite events now. And um, I sang, I, most of the time when I sing, it's an Armenian song. Um, right now I'm trying to learn in two weeks is Yule Feast and I'm trying to learn this intricately complex Armenian period song, uh, Christmas song. So, so anyway, um, so I was nervous having not sung for a, years and what my voice was going to do nervous that it's a different audience yes it's SCA but it's a different kingdom than my home on here and there was Vasilius the guy I was talking about and I just said focus on him just sing for him and it was still I think shaky but so so I have a like he's a special connection for me and so I was more than happy to participate in his nighting and I the, the I did I wanted to wear a bear bear uh garb and I even did some henna stuff and I did the research on the Moroccan henna designs mm -hmm. they would wear and so I would say if you're going to do something that isn't a, normally your culture do some research to pay respects to that and to the people that you are representing with that. Absolutely totally agree and to re reiterate for folks who maybe haven't seen the past previous episodes uh, being very careful and especially culturally aware when it's a living culture. There's a huge difference between having a persona that is from a culture that no longer exists or is in an area that is not oppressed. It's different when you have cultures that are living, that are still oppressed, whether in the U.S. or anywhere else around the world. Um, you need to pay special attention to how you do your research as you said, you know, getting to know the people and being immersed in community. I'm a big believer. If you want to uh, really get to know community, find out where the community is and ask questions, like immerse yourself in it, go to events, you know, there's respectful ways to do that too. Yeah. But it's really important to pay attention to the living cultures. And you talked about just even with 9-11, Again, as we talked about last episode, when Hannah was on here, being mindful that, you know, cultures are still experiencing oppression and trauma, and it doesn't end with a persona. But if you are not from that culture, at the end of the day, you get to take the garb off, but you don't have to face the consequences and the trauma yeah. and the historical oppression that people from the culture do. So I, thank you. I, I completely agree and all mm -hmm. aspects. Do your research. Really and also do also like for instance something as simple as the head of symbols, some of these symbols mean things, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that 
you don't just mark yourself up with just things because they look cool. You have to be sure that the symbol represents what you're trying to portray, that it's not some, you know, something that's like a bad sign or a bad mm -hmm. eagle sign or something. You have to at least even do that, something like that. Do yeah. not use Google Translate. If anybody's listening, no <laughs> Google Translate. It is not your friend. And it's you so funny. I could, someone. I li like, uh, you know, I uh, I did the face. Uh, I said that I when we talked early, earlier yesterday that I hadn't done Facebook until I moved down here to Kai to keep in touch with the people, my friends up here and I'm not here. And, um, and I realized that most of the friends that I have on Facebook are not Armenian. And so I saw that as an opportunity to educate people about Armenian culture and sometimes also Middle Eastern one. So I would often will share some, you know, either like, you know, a, a music video or something you know, or some historical picture of a medieval fortress or something. And it would be in Armenian letters, but sometimes it would have the translation thing. And it's like, I would check it out and it would like be crazy. And I would say, okay, this is what they say, but this is what it means, you know? Yes. But, but sometimes it's a laugh, but yeah. Well, it's like when I go back and I watch uh, captions uh, from the show and I'm like, that's not what I said. Yes, Google Translate's not your friend. Ask someone. <laughs> and don't just run word it program. Oh, autocorrect. I hate autocorrect yes. because it would not recognize foreign words. It will give no. you the, whatever the English word that sounds like what it is you're saying. It just drives me crazy. Oh, absolutely. It's just, it's, and it's sort of like a way of, I, I can't help but feel like, so you're not acknowledging me then as, as, yeah. As a foreigner, as, as that you're not acknowledging mm -hmm. this word that is my language or Arabic language, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like I have to get, and I'd have to do it like two, three times to recorrect it for it to finally get it. That okay, this is what she's talking about. This oh, is yes. the word she wants to go with. It, it's redonkulous. Um, so we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, and it kind of goes hand in hand with this because. We were talking about names and I had shared that one of my, another pet peeve activating point is in court when, now I get names are complicated. Uh, you've pronounced your name for me several times and I still got it wrong. It's it's not, yeah, they don't sink in with me. I, it's <laughs> just you. the duck part, you know? You got the go around <laughs> part, but not the duck. You said duck instead of duke. And I, I was going to go it away, but I just didn't like to call a duck. <laughs> but, but really in court, when folks just kind of do a, oh, well, well, whatever this is, or, or you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to try this. So you know. Right, who yeah, is. I've had that. And we've talked about, you know, in, in names, names have meaning. And so it's very important to like, to call someone the proper, proper name. Cause what you told me a story about it, uh, that you had changed your name and people were still calling you something that means Bob. Hello, yeah. Bob. Well, no, no, it doesn't mean Bob. I mean, that's the cool word. But, yeah. So when I first joined the SEA, my name was Giran Dayas. Uh, Giran is the Armenian name, but again, like I said, the Silesians took on f the French titles and French everything kind of thing. So, and so when I read, ch you know, change all that stuff and change the name, I made the mistake of choosing a name the closest to the old name, thinking that would be easier for my friends to sort of put the two together. Oh, we, they mean Giran. Okay. But Garandolf means daughter of Goran. So G-O-R-A-N is, you know, Bob. But it's not Bob. It's just it yeah. means Goran. You know, that's the guy's name. Yeah. Uh, so when people call me Goran or and they are like in the text or or whatever, and they and they write the name G-O-R-A-N, they're basically calling me Bob. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of G-E-R-A-N, which was my old name. So um, it would be only me that would notice it, obviously, because I've done the research and I know where that name comes from and all that. But it's it's so sort of like oh, it, my my first friend's like, wait, well, okay, I'm Bob, okay, <laughs> or George or whatever, Goran. I'm Gerandult. 
Although in, in Kai, they call me Mistress G because again, they're, you know, there are people who do, who, and I really appreciate it, who do take the time to learn how to say my name, but, um, but. It's those um, little things. But it's, it's my, it's, but it's my, it's a nickname and I've come to feel affection for it when I'm being called yeah. Mr. G. It's also a way to know what kingdom I'm in because if someone's calling me Giran, I know I'm in on chair, so I was calling me Mr. G. <laughs> I'm in Kali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's those little things that I think are really important and that not everybody has to think about all the time. Um, that I know for I mean, there's many different cultures and many different names that are, are very nuanced and changing a syllable, changing a stress yeah. point, it like can make a world of difference. Yeah, like G-O-R-A-N instead of G-E-R-A-N. You know, G-E-R-A-N right. is a, is the name well in, in in it's the female's name in this case and uh g-o-r-a-n is the guy's name <laughs> who <laughs> i am the daughter of <laughs> well and so i think it's it's I, I i encourage folks if you want to learn about the culture to find not not only find people in the culture but ask questions about how to pronounce your name even if they're like me and you're going to get it wrong try yeah, and I appreciate that. That's what I appreciate is the, the trying of it, it's like the effort. Yeah. Yeah. Try, ask questions. Cause you were telling me about um, a lot of the, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the names that you were looking at or considering are names of queens and princesses. Yeah, because, the, you know, in general, culturally speaking, in Armenian culture, it's like they talk you know, when you're looking at the history stuff and then the chroniclers of the time, they would of course talk about King so-and-so went into battle with so-and-so and all that. Or, you know, it's like the only time you would hear about females, it's queen so-and-so sponsored this Bible to be done to me, you know, this, the illuminated manuscript thing, or, you know, or she sponsored a church to be done, you know? So the only time, you know, because in the SEA we have to document if we want to register our names, we have right. to document our names. Um, I could, I only had for my research back in the 80s and in a way still now, not really, isn't it? but yeah, it's, Gorondot is a queen. Uh, the thing I was talking about that I research most of my, I center most of my costume research on is just the one fragmented um, illuminated page of an illuminated manuscript of mm -hmm. King Gagik, their daughter, uh, Mariam and uh, Queen Gorandot. Uh, that's where I got the name. It's 11th century. That's the one I, mm -hmm. I chose, 11th century. So, and this is, this is why research is important if you're looking at other cultures to know these, uh, know these aspects. Um, there was something that you had said uh, when we were talking about um, your laurel ceremony in particular. So for those, I don't know if we've even mentioned, well, you did, we mentioned that you had your laurel for, um, research and specifically really Armenian culture. But when you, you did your laurel ceremony, you brought in your Armenian culture. I loved that story because I did something similar. So I, I want, I want you to, if you're okay, Telling it to the audience too, because oh, sure. it's pretty amazing. My pleasure. It's, um, um, so most people who know do know me that I try in every aspect I can to introduce the Armenian culture because it's again it's not just me educating myself, but it's a way to, ed to educate people. Because when you go into the history books in your school, you learn about the Greeks, you learn about the Romans, you don't learn about the Armenians, and what re the real secret is the Armenians were there a long time. The oldest map actually is a Babylonian map and the only country that still exists is Armenia that's mentioned there. Wow. So we go back a long time and we have maintained that culture and tradition still today. So it's every opportunity I can, I try to introduce who we are. We are not just some almost extinct if you, tribe or something. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, it was a total surprise when they offered it for me. It was uh, two months I had in my head, a year, years if this thing was ever going to happen to me but instead I was given two months <laughs> until 12th night so I had 
the option of using the standard SCA um, ceremony, laurel ceremony. And then I, when I could, I would put in elements, Armenian elements. And so I, I couldn't do as much research, but I did enough that, it, that, that could help me, guide me through this. So I, first of all, I tried to involve as many people who have been influencing me in the SCA. The person I mentioned, Sir Richard, he was like, he's my SCA dad. His uh, now ex-wife, uh, Gwendolyn, she is my SCA mom. Um, and of course, I, Dagmar, she did, uh, she sang the procession song for me. So uh, I used a, um, I used a, a, an Armenian procession song that is used for the head of our church, the kind of equivalent to the Pope. We call them Catholicos. And uh, she learned this Armenian uh, song. I, she asked me to, to record it on a cassette tape. That's how old it is. <laughs> this was in <laughs> 2003 <laughs> is when it happened. And uh, she learned how to pronounce this uh, song that way. And I had with me, because um, the thing that was supposed to happen was Twelfth Night was supposed to be the time where I was going to be formally the journeyman of uh, Mariam al Baghdadi, but instead <laughs> they surprised me. So she was part of the procession. Uh, she carried a box with earth from Armenia. Um, I had um, I had my family there. My mom, who at the time was living in Lebanon, uh, we have her here now. Um, she happened to be visiting us, and so she was part of the ceremony. Um, she, um, they, they read out, <laughs> this is funny actually, they read out the non-existent physically scroll. <laughs> she did it in Armenian, and um, I think, uh, yeah, Candace Elizabeth did the English. She was my herald. So, um, Back to the procession. Yeah, the procession, I had my dad, my sister, my mom was actually there at the front. My friend Fjorlif, Mr. Fjorlif made my banner, which I still have. And uh, while we processed, uh, His Grace Duke Thorne was my escort. And um, his wife sang this Armenian song. Um, and I almost started to cry already because it just, I, it moves me when people who uh, normally this isn't their language uh, speak or sing in that language. There's this movie a few years ago, it had Christian Bale and Oscar Isaacs in it, it called The Promise. And it's sort of about the Armenian genocide, but with like a love story kind of thing. And there's a scene like at a wedding where Oscar Isaac is making a speech in Armenian and it was perfect. You would think he was Armenian. And I started to cry. I wasn't crying during the genocide scenes, you know, I cried just hearing this guy who I know this isn't his language and he not only spoke it, but he spoke it perfectly. So I had that same feeling with the Dagmar, my friend singing. And um, I held in my hand uh, I, a handkerchief and embroidered, embroidered by my grandmother mm. so that she is represented. My, um, my uh, dad's mom, who was the only survivor of the genocide. And up at ahead during the ceremony, um, we had, oh, I have it too. Oh, it's in there, you can't see it. So a week before or a week or two before, there was a workshop done by a refuse artist from Armenia and a group of us, including Mistress Fjordi, Master Bill, we went there to watch and at the end of it, he's doing this refuse thing on it. On, this piece, and this was like an Armenian style cross on a square piece. And at the end of it, he just gave it to me as a gift. I said, mm -hmm. I'm using that for my fealty thing. <laughs> you know? So because it's raw on the edges, we didn't frame it. I, we used, um, <coughs> I used another piece of cloth that's embroidered by my other grandmother, my mom's mom, so that both of them are being represented. Oh. So the ancestors are always there for me. During a, the 
sort of once I was like inducted in the Laurel thing, I, probably I think after the fealty, I was anointed, here's the funny part, <laughs> anointed uh, from oil from Etmiazin, which is the Vatican, if you will, the Armenian Vatican. But the reason why it's funny is because when I was researching this, I was trying to think, well, you know, what can I sort of correlate from, you know, period Armenian thing to, mm -hmm. to SCA? And what I found out is um, the Crusaders went through Armenia and, and uh, or Cilicia, which is the minor kingdom I was talking about on their way to Jerusalem. And some of these guys um, married Armenian princesses and got estates and titles. And some of them were adopted by, like this guy, this knight was adopted by an Ar Armenian princely family. And part of the adoption ceremony was the prospective son would rub his chest with oil and the prospective father would rub his chest with oil and they would share this, huge chemise, big shirt, and they would rub each other's chests. <laughs> and then it said that the same thing would be repeated with the prospective mother, which I actually doubt because I can't imagine the female being involved in that sort of ritual. But I thought, well, I would love to do this, but it would freak out the people in the SCA if I'm like rubbing my oily chest with the king, you know? So we'll just do the little mark on my forehead kind of thing. So I had that. Uh, well, the uh, Armenian thing that I have. Uh, my mom, yeah, said, did the text, the Armenian text. Um, I was not really Armenian, but I had the, the, the magic umbrella. For a time, um, those of us who belong to these outsider groups, formed, a, it's not really a household, but we just formed this group called the Antir Nomads. And it was just all these lost orphans, if you will, you know, it's Mongols and Turkmen's and, and I was part of that. And when each of us has a peerage ceremony, we would have the magic umbrella, which I think is with Ashaxi. The last time I talked to her, she mm -hmm. said she might have it in her house. But it's got these gorgeous dangly bits and tassels and things. And so that was that was gonna be, that was used in my procession by um, Akhirli Noah, um, Ludviga's uh, husband. And, um, but the poor guy, you know, once, once the ceremony was done, Mariam took me and said, let's go from the side, because there were a lot of people there. I mean, a lot of laurels were there. And so we couldn't go through the middle aisle because it would just would take forever. So he was there trying to follow me with the magic <laughs> as part of my ceremony. And here she like whisked me off. But what was wonderful is that after it was all done, while you're way back there, you're like getting congratulated and stuff. He's out there standing there with a magic umbrella. And then he had to be part of a nighty ceremony thing. So he gave that duty to his squire who is oh. the magic umbrella still there. So in a way, it was still part of the ceremony. But um, yeah, that was my ceremony. Well, and then you had a special scroll that you told yes. me about. Yeah, I have a scroll that's, um, which is why it took forever <laughs> to physically get to me because it's, it's a, it would, it, they finally found someone courageous enough to take it on. I wanted a, a scroll that has Armenian text and have the English translation of it on the other side. Uh, so uh, it's, I got it on the 25th anniversary of the barony of Lemaire just before COVID. So like three, maybe four, three and a half years ago or something I have, I physically have it <laughs> finally. Okay. But it was sort of given to me at my laurel ceremony verbally, but, but uh, they've been, there were some fits and starts over the years, but it finally got to me. No, I, th way. I think that's amazing. That's so special. Well, it's like, it, it had to be that way. Over the years, yeah. I've seen other peerages of uh, these different cultures being represented and their scrolls being done with their language and stuff. And I said, if this ever happens to me, that definitely has to be part of it. Yeah. So it was worth the wait. No, that's fantastic. I hope we start to see more of that. I have lately. 
uh, but love seeing people bringing in their their personal culture or ethnicity into the SCA and really, yeah. you know, exposure. Because we also talked about, you know, one of the ways to combat bigotry, bias, uh, ignorance, yeah. really, is exposure to other cultures. And that's a that's an amazing way not only to have something done that is so personal and meaningful to you, but that gives other folks a uh, glimpse into the culture. Well, it was my way. It's like, it wasn't my, I, I, the way I saw it was, this isn't my ceremony. This is the ceremony for the, our, the Armenians. This is sort of like our business card saying, this is who we are. This is our music. This is our textile. This is our tradition. This is our language. This is what we do. You know, this is, this is who we are, you know. And maybe you could be curious and find out more about it if you want, to, you know, because you're not going to see it in your history books. No, no. And, you know, more and more, you know, we were we talked a little bit before the show about the the oral history and how important it is to some cultures because yeah. history, you know, documented history is lost through colonization through natural disasters, through movement, um, all of these different through things. Genocides. Through genocide. The Ar through, Armenians you know, were, two thirds of Armenians were wiped out. And there, and even today it's being done. And also it's physically, their existence is being wiped out by chiseling off physical things like writing, Armenian writing and stuff. So it's, it's a way of totally erasing a culture by physically getting rid of whatever documentation they actually have out there. Mm -hmm. So oral tradition is, I have always said this, that for, at least for me, that I believe that our oral tradition is part of the reason why we Armenians survive as a culture mm -hmm. now, that we still do maintain some of our traditions and stuff. It isn't because of what's been written because so much of it has been lost. By the way, of the songs that I do, the, um, there he is, I have a picture of him. <laughs> Go, there's, um, again, if you're my Facebook friend, you would know this because I mention him all the time. Gomidas, uh, 20th century, he was a, not only a priest, but he was a composer, but also a, a musicologist. And he went around Armenian villages in Turkey and, and also in Ar and all around just to record people's songs. And, and so a lot, of, and, and not just um, like, folk songs, but also the older stuff. And so all of these, those of us who, who, who sing these songs, we owe everything to Gomidas. And what we have today is only a fraction of what actually he collected because he, the priest, this is the pattern that happens with all the genocides. The first people that, that are targeted are the intelligentsia and that included the priests. So the priest, mm -hmm. He saw all these guys getting killed. He also was was arrested and stuff, and somehow he, he escaped uh, death. But he was so haunted with it for the rest of his life. It it um, it just haunted his existence. So so what we have now, which is like I don't know, was it three hundred? Is it? I think it's like three hundred pieces, something like that. It's a fraction of what the guy actually collected. Imagine what was lost so, and. So what even the oral tradition we have, we would have had a lot more if it wasn't for the disaster that happened to us with the Absolutely. genocide. And really the the intentional erasure. And you know, a, a reminder to folks who are watching also that, you know, cultures written by the colonizers, by the, you know, the oppressors. And so even as you're doing your research, it's important to yeah. take a look at the sources. Um, again, and so going to the community is always a great place to start because history is often whitewashed and written by the oppressors. And so, but even and even I would say even like I've looked at some of I've read some of the medieval chroniclers of the Armenian chroniclers talking about the battle this and the battle that or whatever. But even that is because they they are the king's chroniclers, the Armenian king's chronicles. So obviously the Armenians are going to sound great. And the enemy is going to sound, oh, these guys, right. these, you know. So even if the sources, the period sources are of that culture, also look at it in a kind of, uh, just remember who are they writing for, you know. Yeah, yeah, 
exactly. And it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's absolutely difficult to do, uh, especially as you're doing research. You know, there are so many resources, depending uh, right. on what you're researching and sifting through is difficult, but that's also what makes, what helps you avoid the cultural appropriation is by doing the holistic, looking at all sides of the culture, all different sources, and really putting it together with guidance from someone within the culture. But it's so, so important not to just, I mean, we joked about Wikipedia. Wikipedia. (laughs) Wikipedia can be a jumping off place, but it's not, it's not a reliable source. Right. And, and taking all of the sources together and being mindful about who's doing the writing and who, who the audience they are writing for is. And a lot of times I also, what I try to do to get, if I could get deeper, I want to look at what's the archeological evidence of this, or Mm -hmm. what's the DNA evidence of that. So that I could get a more, for me, a more reliable opinion about whether, whether it's a, usually it's a textile piece or, or, what you know whatever you know so so it, it, research has, can't be just like we said just wikipedia it has to be a multi-layered thing for try to because you're only as good as your sources and right. if you the more layered well-layered sources you get the better your research the better your product but if exactly. you have an actual project that you're going to be doing So for someone who, excuse me, um, we've talked a lot about people of color starting to get into researching their own histories now that, you know, Western culture has fallen away or has now been, you know, removed, what have you. Um, How would you recommend that people go about uh, researching some of the more obscure cultures or hard to find information um, I think, and so folks listening, research Laurel here, so pay attention. What are some recommendations you have for people who are just starting their journey of researching their own ethnicity? If you're going to do um, online stuff, like we said, um, the reason why Wikipedia <coughs> hold on, is, isn't as reliable because it's constantly changing because other people decide to change it stuff you know they go in and they decide oh this whatever so I would say look at in in the online sources uh, museums and um, universities because especially they have uh, sometimes actual department like I keep saying textiles because that's my 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 uh, thing I sometimes English escapes me what is the word my game I I guess that's the word (laughs) it's exciting yeah, my passion, I guess. So let's say, okay, let's just say textiles. So some of these places have an actual textile department and not only have departments on textile, but they have like the actual cultural specific textile department in these museums and, and these um, universities. And they've done some of this research and they have the research and they have the actual the pieces and the pictures that maybe you've seen in books It'll be one or two, but they have much more of them that have different angles that will give you a better idea of what this thing in Majigi is made of and what does the inside look like. And and uh, so I would say, look into those sources, uh, reach out to them, contact them, ask them. Don't tell them you're doing this for the SCA. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, just say that. You know, you're researching this thing and and you want to know as much as possible. And if they have any additional pictures to help you uh, understand this piece better or how this piece is made and et cetera. So um, that's like the ground foundation part of the research. I would say the sources go there, universities, museums, and then reach out to these guys. Mm -hmm. The other, I would say, um, like you said, if it's like a, a, a obscure culture. Um, speak if you're able to. If you're lucky to live in California, where there are sort all sorts of obscure cultures living here, um, uh, see if you know. Reach out to them as well. Um, some of them may be very insular, but you might be lucky to have a, a 
a roommate who's from that country. A lot of times when people choose Armenian persona, my first question is always, what made you interested in something like Armenian? And it's usually because their college roommate was Armenian mm -hmm. or something like that. So it could be someone like that. Or it could be someone that works at the library you go to all the time. It could be anybody like that. Just be aware, be a, uh, alert and reach out. I mean, try at least. If, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But yeah, try to try to actually get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Time because and they energy. live that culture. Right. <laughs> oh. Right. And even if you're, I'd say, it, even if you're having difficulty connecting with, uh, you know, the 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 museums or or whatever you're trying to do, reach out in the SCA. I mean. It, you may be looking in a small community and may have to do the time, but at least connecting with the Skadian community can help bring some of that, um, I don't want to say avoid faux pas, but really, I mean, you're taking a culture and bringing it into this right. fantasy game. Yeah. Yeah. And can, someone who is from the culture already in the game can help right. yeah. bring that in a respectful manner. Yeah. So if you want to do Armenian, talk to me. <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. You heard it here. Also, from. There's all these different uh, Facebook groups that are culture specific, like the SCA Armenian, but there's also like, you know, Italian Renaissance groups or, or you know, Norse or whatever. It's just within the SCA, there's actually specific groups, right. like Facebook groups that you can join to get more detailed information. I have to say I've been watching the chat and there is so much praise for you um, and all the teaching you do on your page uh, for other people, um, your Facebook posts that people have learned so much from your Armenian posts. But I have to know because there's this one, I have to know, uh, there's one from Tenup who's been on the show before. My favorite post you shared yeah. was the one explaining the different types of apricots apricots i have to know because i didn't know i didn't i had no clue what oh, i shared uh I, there's <laughs> i don't know about the different types but i know that i shared uh i want people to know that apricots are armenian they come from armenia and the actual scientific name is like Armenian prune or plum, I think it's called some, I mean, like the Latin version of that. And I did the same thing with the, the sheep, you know, there's an army and, and a dog. Recently I shared one where it's a specific Armenian breed dog. So when I come across this, you know, I just want to let people know that, uh, you know, like the apricot, uh, you might think it's from somewhere else, but it's from us. <laughs> well, and someone just asked, ask her how to make apricot tarts. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm not a cook. Um, <laughs> I have absolutely no idea the way you make any other kind of tart. Is, is it my <laughs> But no, no, I don't know. Sorry. You just made Who knows? It. Yeah, I do, I, I do want to offer to you and to anybody else who's listening, you know, if you come, um, you know, you, you come across something that you think would be great for the Voices of Color page, please feel free to drop it in. Uh, yeah. This is also a place to provide education. And um, for those watching, um, we're going to post um, some photos of your laurel scroll, you sent me your AOA, oh, okay. some sources of information on your, um, to this episode. So folks can take a look at anything else you want to add, uh, because I'm a firm believer. Yes. Let's put the information out there, connect it to your video. So when people are watching, they can go back and look at the sources later. Yeah. I just picked out, um, like three different kinds of sources, I think, cause I didn't want to overwhelm people. One I want to actually mention is speaking of scrolls, uh, the Matena Daran and, uh, um, uh, is a, it's a library, but it's much more than that in Armenia. It's the first place I will go if I ever go to uh, Armenia. It's, it's a museum. It's, it is, it has the biggest collection of uh, illumination manuscript in there, but it also has lots of other things. And I think the site I 
I don't know. I, I mean, it's their main site, but they, I think there's also something called virtual Matena Daran, where you actually, they digitalized all of this uh, mm -hmm. stuff that they have. So if you're interested in illumination and stuff like that, you could check. I wanted to include that for those people. And no. I, included, like, I included a site that just talks about regional traditions and holidays and weddings and cost, it has pictures of people, costumes and stuff. And, and then I included people of R is more about ancient Armenian history and it's more history stuff. So it's a little bit of culture, a little bit of history, a little bit of a art That's being fantastic. represented by the three things I used. Um, so we always end with kind of the advice for um, people who want to be allies, people who want to help make the SCA welcoming for all. Obviously, one, you have influenced a lot of people and have really made impressions on a lot of people, um, not only just based on the chat that I've been watching, but the uh, as soon as I put out the poster announcement for your episode, uh, I saw the comments coming in about, you're just a wonderful person. She's just, you're my favorite person. Well, and really appreciate that you have, um, that you went before that you and others paved the way for folks like me by just being your authentic self, regardless of what was expected, that you have immersed yourself fully and brought that in and continue to teach on a daily basis. So I thank you for that. What advice might you have for people who want to be better allies, who want to help create the SCA uh, in, in the way that it really should be? Uh, again, I'd say, listen, you know, it's probably the most important thing is listen, it's not an opportunity to, to, for you to have a megaphone, it's for them to do that, you know, um, so, and, and I, by listening, I also mean in that there are experiences people have that you don't have, and you, you would never, it would never occur to you that something is an issue for them. Like, like uh, I mentioned that I, I watched, I watched the credits of a movie just so I could watch if there are any Armenian names or Arabic names, uh, because that to me is a sign of being represented. Like, yay, look at that, one of us made it. And, and I've been made fun of for, for doing that, but that's the thing behind it. You know, that's the reason behind it. Or for, for, uh, the longest time, if I go to the shop, I always make sure my hands are shown because I've had experience where, where the manager or whatever is following me around because they think I'm a shoplifter. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, some. this is something that other people experience when they go into stores, do they even think about that? But I, even to this day, I still do that. Every time I go to any shop, I always, make, even the grocery stores, I always make sure you know, when I'm handling goods or I have my bag and I'm jostling with it, I'm making sure, because I know there's cameras and people are watching, that they see, look, nothing, I'm not shoplifting, look, you know. So that's what I mean by listening. When someone is talking to you and it sounds like they're complaining, you know, oh, that's not a big deal or, oh, come on, yeah. There's a lot more behind this story, you know. There's a lot more to what they're saying to you. So that's... That's what I mean by listening. Um, be genuinely interested when you're asking questions, you know? I mean, I, I, um, I don't, I, I can tell when someone is just being shallow because they just wanna be, you know, either polite or like with it, you know? But if, when they're actually, when I can see that someone is actually interested in knowing this stuff, my answers are gonna more likely be, um, more in depth and more in detail. So you're gonna get even more information than you, you think you were gonna get. <laughs> you're probably going to yeah. get it. We're just on a surface kind of uh, attitude question. Um, I think I like the idea that you were having about having uh, voices of color events, <laughs> you know, to give people uh, opportunities. It's sort of like a, Queen's Tea or something like we would have an opportunity to meet each other and to actually listen and talk to each other and maybe just share not just stories but find connection 
Yeah. And I think it's so, so what I want also want to say is that the, I've always felt that the key to combating ignorance and prejudice is education and exposure. And that's always been my motivation throughout what I do in the SCA, what I do on Facebook, um, yeah, anywhere else, you know, because that's, that's my philosophy. And so that would be my advice. Part, part of my advice for that is if you want to combat these things, uh, educate and expose this culture as much as possible. Let other people know that you know it's not something hidden. You know these are integral part of the society that belong to, whether it's the SEA or the society at large. I want to amplify something that you've said because it came up in my personal life before. When, when you said, you know, listen, and what was also, you know, you didn't say it like this, but hear our stories and believe our stories. For every one story that, you know, is shared on the show, there are 50 other experiences that happen on a daily basis that aren't shared. And so realize that, again, as you're looking at potentially um, having a persona and a culture that is living that you may hear just a fraction of what actually happens in someone's life. Yeah. And, and believe when someone says this happened to me, uh, believe it because uh, again, you know, you may hear one thing that uh, happened, but there were 50 things that happened throughout that day. It's also, it I, it I, I often edit myself when, yes. it, because the other thing about being an immigrant is you're trying to, oh God, here we go. Um, yeah. So hey. what I did when I first joined this country is I became an obvious target because I had a different foreign accent and I looked different. And I was in Golden Bay, Washington, this little town where not many people look like me or came from where I come from. And so it was very obvious to make me a target for stuff. And so I wanted to look like an American and to me, uh, that meant straightening my hair. You know, I would spend hours straightening mm -hmm. my hair. And I even, I tried on the blonde wig and I wished I had blue eyes. And I did all this stuff thinking that that would make me less of a target. And just like in, like later in the late seventies, people spent fortunes to get their hair to look like this, you know? And that's when I said, embrace your ethnicity. You know, mm -hmm. this means something. You know, it means enough that these people want to look like you. But I still, if people, I would not mention about being Armenian or mention about being from Lebanon because I don't want that attention again back to me. You know, the whole, oh, I'm a foreigner, you know, mm -hmm. only when people ask me questions. And even then I kind of edit it because I realize, especially whenever there's political situations going on, again, I mean, at least the yes. Middle East, USA is involved. And I'm, hey, what do you think about this war there or whatever? I know that I have to sort of figure out, is this person asking me really, do they really want the answer or my view? Or are they looking for a, an opportunity to argue with me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I kind of, well, first of all, my first feeling is, oh crap, I'm not American enough. I don't look at, I don't pass yet. Still, mm -hmm. I still don't, right? That's, that's an old feeling. I don't feel that way at all now. But, when I do answer, I would I would just gauge and say, well, is it safe for me to tell them my absolute true opinion about what's going on, or should I just edit myself? Because it's one thing to let's say to tease your your brother; it's another for somebody else teasing your brother. You know, Absolutely. you fight like hell to protect your brother, right? So it's like one thing for me, let's say me as in let's say an American person who was born here um to this america it's another issue when it's a foreigner no matter how long i've been here you know it's and no matter how much like an american i sound it's i'm still a foreigner it's kind of obvious one because of this but also because i you know I, I now embrace the ethnic stuff so um some people are are um receptive to hearing my uh, true uh, opinion, because they really want to educate themselves about it, the situation. Mm -hmm. They don't, like you said, talk to somebody, you know, if, uh, 
if you want to be an ally, talk to somebody from my community and all that. So there are some people who really do want to know that and some people who don't. So I sort of just gauge it by that, you know? Yeah. So it, uh, yeah. what I tell them depends on my judgment, my test, if, you, if what, what kind of person this is who's asking me this question. You know, do they really want to know this or is this just as an excuse to argue with me? And if it's yeah. an excuse to argue, it's like, forget it, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, there, that's too much for that. Yeah, and Trump made things really impossible to oh. because I have to argue all over the place. And you people, you know, do you understand? We come here to be safe, and you bring a guy like this to be the leader, you know. And then you want to bring church into. Uh, my dad actually was a Republican until back around the eighties. He saw these religious right people getting involved in the in the uh, politics, and he comes from the Middle East, where the church and state, or the mosque and state are not divided he knows better and he left the republican party during that time because he knew that that does not belong in this country and and there's trying to do that again now you know it's like do you not understand <laughs> listen yeah. to the people who had that experience in the old country who've come here for that better life for their kids and stuff and they're telling you don't do this don't do this you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna hate it this isn't the kind of country you are and, yeah, so I, I don't, when Trump came along, I don't edit myself as much. I have, if, if I feel like I have to say, no matter what the reception is going to be, I have to tell people what I know or what I feel or what I see from experience uh, and hopefully to prevent the disaster, you know. Well, and the, the media is, I mean, media is biased to begin with. But it's filtered, you know, we're not seeing, uh, people aren't seeing the full story. They're seeing what media wants them to see. I can't even get started on Trump, uh, <laughs> but it, it's a good, like that, that makes That's my another show. boil. That is a whole other show. And that is something that would have to be censored day in and day out. Muslim ban. Right? Muslim yeah. ban. Oh, like, oh, oh here we go. Yeah. Do yeah. not get me started on that, Dude. man. Dude. But it is a good reminder when we vote vote like the lives of the people you care for people of color queer people uh you know people who identify as disabled veterans as if their lives matter because it's not even that not only that not when, only that, when yeah. it's per present when you're when uh, still that way now, but it may stop being that way. But when you are electing a president, you're not only electing the president of this country, but in a way you're, you are selecting the leader of at least the Western world, if you will, you know, the, the developed world. So mm -hmm. understand that when you fall, so do they, because the, the whole economical thing being so connected with each other just, just for that, if not for all the other issues on that. And so, so it isn't just about, yeah, you know, voting for because of your life. Well, first, first of all, I, I vote every time because women fought to have to give me that right, you know, back in Lebanon, and at least during the Civil War. Uh, there were snipers when people were standing in line to vote. So I know that in other countries, I'm not able to do such a thing. So I have to vote just for that, just even for that, whether it counts or not, but I think it does. But, uh, but I'm also, in, when I think about selecting leaders in this country, I'm putting that in mind that it's not just in this country, it's gonna affect other, yeah. the, the other world, other parts of the world. Absolutely. And we do not need another president who throws paper towels at people. <laughs> oh, okay, that's, the, that's the least of his sins, I would think. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> There's so many, so oh, many. Oh, good like, Lord. Like you said, it's another show. It's a whole other show. It's a month long show. <laughs> the latest stuff that's happening here. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lord. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lord. Well, I think you forgot. Yeah, and unfortunately, and most of the Armenians vote for the guy, you know? We, I can't even get started on people from oppressed cultures who vote for people like that. I just can't. <laughs> I don't understand it and it makes me so angry. Anyways, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. I was really excited to have you. I, I you know, I enjoyed everything that you shared today. 
Um, I, there's so many parallels you actually, and I didn't want to go on it, but uh, so many parallels between your experiences and my experiences, and I'm sure other people of color, when I was thinking about, you know, trying to look white, I also did the straightening of the hair and did the, you know, dressing in mainstream clothes or whatever. Um, and this is why we have this show to, sh to, to really, right. you know, help people understand that they're not alone. Those experiences aren't theirs. You can see across cultures, people of color have these similar stories. Um, and so, you know, this show is really important to me and people like you who come on and volunteer to be on here and be your authentic self, which is not easy. Uh, really well, that's why I'm going. such a fan of the show. I'm so glad that you brought it back after your hiatus because it's, a, it's an important, show. it's not just another interview type show, a CA centered, interview type show but it's it's much more it's a lot bigger than what it is well and so we are continuing to do lineup for 2023 I do want to announce a special episode um uh given the recent um uh shooting at the um um uh, gay club we want to do a queer people of color episode. So that will be coming up next. Uh, I'm putting together a panel. So y'all look out for that invitation. And then 2023 is coming up. We will probably do a wrap up show with the hosts and talk about um, you know, what we look forward to and some changes that are coming up. And then we have some guests lining up and we're putting it all together. Uh, you know, This show gives me passion every time I have such a fantastic guest uh, sitting with me. I'm re-energized and, you know, uh, oh, we just keep great. going. There's so yeah. much more, so many more stories to be told though, but we'll have to see if we can do another show on this. On uh, absolutely. Way bigger than just one hour. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there are many people that are going to have to come back and, and you yeah, are absolutely one definitely. of them. <laughs> I love the show a lot. I mean, there was, I always Thank feel you. that I, every time it ends, it's like, oh, damn it. There's this other thing I want to know too. I didn't get to find out. Well, I do want to offer, um, I will be at 12th night. Um, you know, for folks, I know people come from all over. If anybody wants to come to 12th night and have like a little voices of color gathering, I'm happy to put something together so we can all meet and, you know, chit chat and get to know each other. Um, we will also have a live show. Baron Youssef will be doing a live voices of color from 12th night. So we're going to have some excitement. And then you're right. We do need to have a Voices of yeah. Color event and bring people from all over the country. I need to figure it out. Maybe 2024. We'll see. But I think it, it would be phenomenal to have everyone together in one space and, uh, you know, scare the neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope to make it to 12 my bed. I was way too late to go for the hotel situation. So I like this because I like to see how I can manage it is since I won't have a car, you know, to, if, I don't know, do they have shuttles there to take it for people who stay at other hotels? I don't know, but we can chat and let's see what we can do. Yeah. Otherwise I'm, I'll, otherwise I'll send over the two items of the auction that they're going to have there. If I don't make it there physically, I'd love to go. Cause it's, I've been waiting and waiting to, cause I usually go every year at 12 night just to see my friends in Ontario and COVID kind of stopped up for a while and, I was hoping to make it this time too. So we'll see. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for watching. Hopefully uh, you picked up a lot. Uh, there will be some other inform um, additional information attached to the episode. And then like you said, like you said, uh, come ask questions of, uh, you know, if you have questions about Armenian culture, now you know where to go. <laughs> 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 At least on the West Coast, there's like a couple of us, I think. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so there's a few on the East Coast. Some, yeah. All right. Thank you all for watching. Have there's a actually good another Armenian in Kaidi. He's like Armenian persona and Armenian ethnically. But, Very cool. Yeah. We'll share some of those resources. <laughs> okay. Good night, all. all. Thank you. Good night, everybody.